Well, Father, tonight we just want to calm our hearts and um, rest our souls in you. We ask that you speak through your word to us in such a fashion that we get a clear understanding of this important, vital truth that literally transforms our lives. We pray that the Spirit of the Lord would be present in holy power and illuminating insight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, if you'll take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of John, verses 31 and, and 32. <clears throat> Chapter 8, I'm sorry, I failed to give you that. Um, it's a moment of apparent senility. Um, uh, bless Jana's heart, she has to remind me a lot of things. And when I get home, Irma reminds me of a lot of things. I am grateful for those reminders. So um, John chapter 8, thank you. Chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. Jesus is... As you will see, as it will only make sense to understand this context, uh, he is saying some things to those who believed in him. And indeed, in verse 30, uh, he says, as he was saying these things, uh, and he was talking about himself and who he was and, and um, <clears throat> what he'd come to do, as he was saying these things, many believed in him. That's a good thing, is it not? <clears throat> it was a good day in evangelism. People came to believe in Christ. <clears throat> then verses 31 and 32, uh, verse 31 begins, so Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him. Now I want to pause and say this. Um, it's really important to understand Jesus is not here talking evangelistically to sinners. He's talking to those who believed in him. Is it? So I think I'm pretty assured that I'm talking to people in this room for the most part, or if not all of us, who are believers in him. And by the way, that leads me to say this. If you're not a believer, I'd love to talk with you about becoming a believer in Christ. Okay. But I think most of us are. Thus. If he's talking to those who believed in him, verses 31 and 32 is for us, right? Yes, pastor, that's for us. Okay, Here we go. Jesus says, if you abide in my word, you are truly disciples, my disciples. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now, there are a number of textual observations that I want to make. Three basic textual observations. And then I want to spin off from that <clears throat> to step into several uh, components contained in the observations that seem to speak at the very heart of what's involved here. And then we're going to end with points of danger or confusion and danger as it regards to this point. First, the textual observations. <clears throat> Jesus is differentiating here, first of all, from those who believe in him and those who are disciples, disciples of his. Do you see that? You don't see that. Well, let me see if I can help you. Verse 31 says, Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, now, that's a past tense verb. They believed in him. That They've already believed. And then he says, if, here's a condition, the, uh, the conditional part of the sentence, if you abide in my word, then, the word then isn't there in the text, but it's assumed, then you are truly my disciples. Well, right, wait a minute. He's talking to believers. They're disciples, right? Not necessarily. 
Sometimes I think we make a mistake here. Oh, praise the Lord. We had 30 people believe on Christ. That's great. How many are going to turn out to be disciples? Well, what does that mean? Well, six months from now, are they in church? Do they read their Bibles? Do they pray? Do they love Jesus? Do they make choices in life based on what God has said in his word? And we have to be careful. Because I hope we understand. I've hammered on this. Brother Terry, I don't know how many times. I know you all are bored with me hammering on this. But I'm going to do it at least one more time. There is no biblical category for believing on Christ unto salvation and not be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And we have to watch our language. Well, I know they're saved because they prayed the prayer. Well, you know what? When I got saved, I prayed. <laughs> okay. But that didn't mean I was a disciple until I'm living out that faith I declared in my life. And the only assurance that we have in Scripture that anyone is truly and genuinely saved are those who are living lives of discipleship. Is it getting warm in here? Or say, so, well, that makes me uncomfortable. Actually, I think that's a comforting truth. If you have, if you have a heart for Jesus, if you love Jesus, if you want to honor Jesus, you fail a lot. I get it. So do I. But you don't want to. I have shirts. It says wrinkle resistant. They will wrinkle, but they don't want to. But the point is, I feel guilty when I don't read my Bible. Do you? When I'm not praying, I feel guilty. I'm going to tell you, when I, when I sin, I feel guilty. By the way, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Because this, this is the heart of a disciple who wants to walk with God, honor God, obey God, love God, and live in the light of God's truth, albeit imperfectly. So that's the first thing. Number two, and these are just textual observations. <clears throat> um, the command... The condition, which contains a command, is this whole idea of abiding in his word. Now, what does he mean by his word? Which word? Is it grace or faith or belief or, or love or what is it? Well, it's not just a word. The word word means teaching. So when you read the word word, you can substitute the word teaching. If you abide in my teaching, then you're truly my disciples. Thus, <clears throat> um, he is calling his, those who believe in him to abide in his word. And this describes their discipleship. Okay, this is very, very important. Uh, what does Jesus want of his believers? He wants us to obey him. He wants us to regiment our lives according to his word. He wants us to feed on the manna of his truth. And he wants us to drink in these glorious teachings so that we're satisfied with them. And we don't live like the world lives. We don't follow the patterns of the culture. We, we follow Christ. We're obeying his word. We're abiding in his word. And that demonstrates our, our discipleship. Third observation is that if we do this, abiding in his word, demonstrating our discipleship, means two things. So here are two sub-thoughts in this textual observation. One is we will know the truth. And two, knowing the truth sets us free. By the way, I, I don't have enough time to preach on all of this. And it's really frustrating me because I'd like to regale on this just a little while. But let me just suffice to say this. There is hidden inside the words of Jesus uh, a, an acknowledgement 
of human epistemological limitations. Now, you, that, you don't like what I just said. Let me rephrase that. There are limitations on what we can know. Epistemology is the study of knowledge. Epistemos is a Greek word for knowledge. Thus, epistemology is a study of knowledge. And it, it deals with what can we know, to what degree can we know it, and in by what means do we know what we know. Here Jesus says, look, if you abide in my word, this is the challenge, this is the command. If you will live in the light of my word and, and regulate your life, that your moral and belief compasses are, are orientated by the teaching of my word, then you will know the truth. Meaning what? You didn't know it till then. Okay. Now listen, mark it down. The world doesn't know the truth. They, they don't get it. You can have three PhDs and be dumb as a stump about the things of God. Paul wrote about that in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 12 through 13. These are spiritual things, spiritual words, delivering spiritual thoughts to spiritual minds, meaning who? Christians. And yet God's truths are foolishness to the carnal mind, the unsaved mind. So you cannot... Christian church, Baptist church, Baptist convention, take thoughts designed by pagans and adopt those thoughts as helpful to you in ministry because they are dumb on the things of God. They are ignorant on the things of God. It is the word of God <laughs> that makes us know the truth. And in knowing the truth, we are set free. Freedom, I will argue, is the inherent gift of God to those who know and believe in Jesus Christ. And any effort to bind people who are free, you need to read Galatians. Because that's exactly the heartbeat of that entire epistle. Don't get back under bondage again. Christ made you free. That's another sermon. And by the way, I preached through Galatians. Do you remember that? All right, some components that come out of that. I've been scratching some of them already. Let me just clarify and make cl clear. Okay, abiding in Jesus' word thus means taking the Bible as our authoritative teaching and guide. And we will argue that it is the all-sufficient teaching and guide. You don't add another book. Mormons have three books, the Bible being one. Do you know that? Mormonism has three books, the Bible being one. Baptists better not have any other Bible other than other book other than the Bible. It's the Bible and the Bible only. That is our authoritative teaching guide too. Abiding in Jesus's words means that we regimen our lives by the word of God. That's application. James 1 talks about not being a forgetful hearer but be a doer of the word. You read, you study, you come to understand, put it into practice. Three, abiding in Jesus's word means that we take God's word over other human ideas. And four, abiding in Jesus's word in this fashion means that we love Jesus supremely. And we want to honor him most of all. Points of confusion and danger. First confusion. These are practical thoughts that I have in light of what Jesus said. First, don't confuse what people say about the word of God with what the word of God says. I'm going to say that again. Don't confuse what people say about the word of God with what the word of God says. This means that we shouldn't confuse a teaching based on the Word of God with what the Word of God says. And don't confuse an attempt to apply the Word of God with what the Word of God says. Do you get the point? Yes? No? If, if I say this is what the Word of God says, 
that should not be good enough for you. I hope you listen. I may be having a good day and I'm right. I may be having a bad day and I'm wrong. But assuming I'm right, you don't take my word for it and presume it's right because I said it's right. Where do you go? The by, by the way, isn't that why we need to learn how to interpret the scripture? Because it's your obligation in your life and in your family to make sure you get it right. And you don't depend on a preacher or a leader or a priest or a pope. Do Baptists have popes? I don't think we do. Some act like it. Well, and I've heard people say this in Baptist Church. The Southern Baptist Convention says this. It must be right. I just want to get some. Where's that tin penny nail? I want to bite it into. That, that is an attack on scripture. You must get it right. Now, the teaching may be right, but it's confirmed by the word, not by the man delivering it. And, and this is a big one. I, I talked about application. Let's say you go to the Bible and you read and you get it right in some, and you get convicted and you apply this in a certain way in your life. Do you have the right to take your application of that truth and preach it to somebody else? No. Why? Because you cannot bind another's conscience with your application of truth. It's only the word of God that binds the conscience. You may do a good job applying it, but that's for you. Don't you tell somebody else they can't unless the Bible says they can. All right, let me get back on track. Don't get confused by that. Now, here's the danger. And I'll conclude with this. I have a statement to make that I believe with all of my heart, and I've thought about it a while before I type it. To add anything to what God says in the Bible or to turn an application of Scripture into an idea that's equal with the Bible is paramount to adding to the Scripture, which means substituting for the word of God, period. And then I have a word to give you following that statement or a sentence, a short sentence with a big word. This is idolatry. Last sentence. This leads to darkness. You think I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. This is the, the danger in our church. This is the danger in our association of churches. This is the danger in America today among Christians. And I'm talking about us. We're talking about believers. What's the call? Be a disciple of Christ. Follow Jesus, not men. Follow the Bible, not the teachings of men. That is the challenge. That is the need. And that is what we must do today and in the days to come. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that we will not elevate any human being to the place of authority except Jesus Christ alone. And may we only take the word of God to be our guide, our compass, and our teaching. Give us the wherewithal and the ability to learn how to learn the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray.